the way they went around over a long period of time, one could be very careful to check that everything was according to Hort Newton. I'd <laughs> Turned out not to be the case. The moons of Jupiter appeared to be first to uh, get sometimes to eight minutes ahead of time and sometimes eight minutes behind time schedule, where schedule is the calculated values according to Newton's laws. It was noticed that they were ahead of schedule when they were close, when New Jupiter was close to the Earth and behind schedule when it was far away, a rather odd circumstance. And Mr. Roemer, having confidence in the law of gravitation, came to an interesting conclusion that it takes light some time to travel from the moons to the Earth, and that what we're looking at when we see the moons are not how they are now, but how they were the time ago that it took the light to get here. Now, when Jupiter's near us, it takes less time for the light to come, and when Jupiter's further, it takes longer time, so he had to correct the observations for the differences in time, and by the fact that they were this much too early or that much too late, was able to determine the velocity of light. This was the first demonstration that light was not an instantaneously propagating Material. I bring this particular matter to your attention because it illustrates something. That when a law is right, it can be used to find another one. That by having confidence in this law, if something is the matter, it suggests perhaps some other phenomenon. And if we had not known the law of gravitation, we would have taken much longer to find the speed of light because we would not have known what to expect of Jupiter's satellites. This process has developed into an avalanche of discoveries. Each new discovery permits the tools for much more discovery, and this, uh, begin this is the beginning of that avalanche, which has gone on now for 400 years in a continuous process, and we're still avalanching along at high speed at this time. Another problem came up. The planets shouldn't really go in ellipses, because according to Newton's laws, they're not attracted only by the sun but also they pull on each other a little bit, only a little bit, but a little bit is something, and will alter the motion a little bit. So Jupiter, Saturn, and Uranus were big planets that were known, and the calculations were made as to how slightly different than the perfect ellipses of Kepler the planets ought to be going, Jupiter, Saturn, and Uranus, by the pull of one on each other. And when they were finished, the calculations, I mean, and the observations, it was noticed that Jupiter and Saturn went according to the calculations, but that Uranus was doing something funny. Another opportunity for Newton's laws to be found wanting, but courage. <laughs> Two uh, men, both who made these calculations, Adams and Leverrier, independently and at almost exactly the same time, proposed that the motions of Uranus were due to an unseen as yet new planet. And so they wrote letters to their respective observatories telling them to look. Turn your telescope and look there and you'll find a planet. How absurd, said one of the observatories, that some guy sitting with pieces of paper and pencils can tell us where we'd look to find something new planet. And the other observatory was more, uh, well, less, uh, well, the administration was different. <laughs> and uh, they found the Neptune. More recently, in the beginning of the 20th century, it became apparent that the motion of the planet Mercury was not exactly right. And this caused a lot of trouble and had no explanation until a modification of Newton's. This did show ultimately that Newton's laws were slightly off and that they had to be modified. I will not discuss the modification in detail. It was made by Einstein. Now the question is, how far does this law extend? Does it extend outside the solar system? And so I show on the first slide evidence that the law of gravitation is on a wider scale than just the solar system. Here is a series of three pictures of a so-called double star. There's a third star, fortunately, in the picture. So you can see that they're really turning around and that nobody just simply turned the frames of the pictures around, which is easy to do on astronomical pictures. But the stars are actually going around. And by watching these things and plotting the orbit, you see the orbit that they make on the next slide. It's, it's evident that they're attracting each other and that they're going around in an ellipse. According to the way expected, these are a succession of pictures uh, going for all these different periods of time. I think, yes, it goes around this way. And they didn't see it well when it was too close. And here it is in 1905. My slide is very old. It's gone around maybe once more since. And you'll be happy except when you notice, if you have noticed already, that the center is not a focus of the ellipse, but it's quite a bit off. 
so something's the matter with the law. No. It, God hasn't presented us with this orbit face on. It's tilted at a funny angle. And if you take an ellipse and mark its focus and then hold the paper at an odd angle and look at it in projection, it's, the, the focus doesn't have to be at the focus of the projected image. So it's uh, because its orbit is tilted in space that it looks that way. It looks like it's not the right pattern. But it's all right, and you can figure everything out satisfactorily for that. How about a, diff a bigger distance? There's forces between the stars. Does it go any further? than these distances which are not more than two or three times the solar system's diameter. Here's something in the next slide that's 100,000 times as big as the solar system in diameter. And this is a large number of stars, tremendous number of stars. This white spot is not a solid white spot. It's just because of the failure of our instruments to resolve it. But our very, very tiny dots, just like the other stars, well separated from one another, not hitting each other, each one falling through and back and forth through this great globular cluster. It's one of the most beautiful things in the sky, as good as sea waves and sunsets. And the distribution of this material, it's perfectly clear that the thing that holds this together is the gravitational attraction of the stars for each other. And the distribution of the material in the sense of how the stars peter out as you go out in distance permits one to find out roughly how, what the law is of force between the stars, and of course it comes out right that it is roughly the inverse square. The accuracy of these calculations and measurements is not anywhere near as careful as in the solar system. Onward, as gravity extends still further. This is a little pinpoint inside of a big galaxy, and the next slide shows a typical galaxy. And it's clear that this thing again is held together somehow, and the only candidate that's reasonable is gravitation. But when we get to this, con this size, we haven't any way any longer to check the inverse square law. But there seems to be no doubt that these great agglomerations of stars and so these galaxies, which are 50 to 100,000 light years across, the solar system is, well, from the Earth to the Sun is only eight light minutes. This is 100,000 light years that the gravity is extending even over these distances. And in the next slide is evidence that it extends even further. Here is what is called a cluster of galaxies. There's a galaxy here and here and here. There are galaxies here. They're all in one lump of galaxies, analogous to the cluster of stars. But this time, what's clustered are those big babies that I showed you in this previous slide. <laughs> now we, uh, this is as far as, uh, is about one tenth, the, or, well, a hundredth maybe, of the size of the universe and as far as we have any direct evidence that gravitational forces extend. So the Earth's gravitation, if we take the view, has no edge, as you may read in the newspapers when the planet gets outside the field of the gravitation. It keeps on going ever weaker and weaker, inversely as the square of the distance, dividing by four each time you're twice as far away until it mingles with the strong fields and gets lost in the confusion of the strong fields of other stars, but altogether with the stars in its neighborhood pulls the other stars to form the galaxy, and altogether they pull on other galaxies to make a pattern, a cluster of galaxies. So the Earth's gravitational field never ends, but peters out very slowly in a precise and careful law, probably to the edges of the universe. The law of gravitation is different than many of the other, well, is, is very important in the economy or in the machinery of the universe. There are many places where gravity has its practical applications as far as the universe is concerned. But atypically, among all the other laws of physics, gravitation has relatively few practical applications, I mean, the new knowledge